Welcome to lecture three. In this preparation lecture, we will be covering how the concept of quantization revolutionized scientific thinking at the turn of the 20th century. This lecture is divided into two parts. The first is a brief description of what it does it mean for something to be quantized. And the second is to discuss examples where classical mechanics failed to explain physical phenomena, including the specter of black body radiation, the photoelectric effect, and the heat capacity of solids and how the idea of quantization solved these problems. One major difference between a classical and a quantum worldview is that in a classical framework, the values of energy can take on any value continuously. In a quantum framework, the energy can only occur in discrete intervals. These two concepts are illustrated here by a ramp and a staircase. If someone were to walk up the ramp, the height change of the person can take on any value between the top and the bottom. Hence, the person's height is continuous. Conversely, if someone walks upstairs, their height is dictated by the elevation change of the stairs and can only be these values. In this case, the height is said to be quantized. You can think of quantization as the staircase, where the quantity that is quantized can only have certain set values. A key point to remember here is that in the quantum worldview, it is impossible for the quantity which is quantized to take on any intermediate value. Now, Let's look back at what scientific progress looked like at the end of the 19th century in order to set the stage for how the idea of quantization changed our worldview. The scientific community believed that physics was a dead science. Newtonian mechanics was well defined. Gibbs developed a theory of thermodynamics that we still use today. Maxwell, Boltzmann, and Gibbs also developed statistical mechanics, and Maxwell also unified the fields of optics, electricity, and magnetism. Now this is a very large body of accomplishments and it helped usher in a modern era of science in its own right, but these, this body of accomplishments will be referred to as classical mechanics. And inside classical mechanics there were several problems that still existed that were explained only by quantizing energy, and this revolutionized science. Many of these problems that classical mechanics could not explain stemmed from our inability to produce a clear picture of the atom. At the time, our model of the atom was very crude. Then, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, Rodigan discovered the x-ray, and Becquerel discovered radioactivity. These discoveries showed that the atom was far more complex than originally thought. We'll return to the solution to this problem in the next lecture, However, the inability to come up with a classical solution for the atom led to the following failures of classical mechanics. The first physical phenomena we will explore that was inconsistent with classical mechanics is the spectrum emitted from a black body. When objects are heated, they radiate according to the Stefan Boltzmann law, which is E is equal to 4 sigma divided by C times T to the power of 4. And this is where sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann's constant, E is the total radiant energy density, C is the speed of light, and T is the temperature. Now the radiation or light emitted is caused by the vibrations of electrons in the material. So as the temperature increases, the electrons vibrate more vigorously, and the color goes from a dull red to white and then blue. An ideal emitter or absorber absorbs and emits all frequencies and these are called black bodies. Now, the classical explanation for black bodies is expressed as the Rayleigh genes law. It is a law that was consistent with the physics of the time. However, it did a very poor job at reproducing the radiant energy density of black bodies. In the plot on the left, the three curves labeled T1, T2, and T3 are experimentally measured curves for the radiant energy density at those three temperatures. The Rayleigh genes law is the dashed curve, it does a reasonable job at low frequencies, but diverges as the frequency moves past the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. All right, so let's see where the ultraviolet catastrophe gets its name from. The essential thing to take away from this is that if we were to add up all of the energy density from every frequency that came from the spectrum, as predicted by the Rayleigh genes law. And so what I'm writing here is that integral that, that we have to evaluate. And basically what it's saying is that for a given temperature T, we're going to then add up all the energy, which is defined by this rho V dV. 
and we're going to go from 0 to infinity, so we're adding up every single frequency that comes out of our black body, and what that in the end is going to give us is the total energy radiated from this black body. And so if we substitute in for the rayleigh genes law, then what we end up with is the integral of 8 pi nu squared all over the speed of light c cubed times the Boltzmann's constant times t d nu. Now most of these terms are constants, so I can pull almost all of them out. So I'm going to pull out the 8 pi over c cubed kbt. And what I'm going to be left with is an integral from 0 to infinity of nu squared d nu. And using the, the inverse power law, then I'm going to have still e is equal to 8 pi c cubed times the Boltzmann's constant kb times t. And so the inverse power law tells me that I'm going to have nu cubed divided by 3 evaluated between the 0 and infinity. And so if I evaluate this, this part of the integral, I use the fundamental theorem of calculus, e is equal to 8 pi c cubed kvt. Well here I'm going to have, I'm going to pull that 3 out, and so what I'm going to get is infinity cubed minus 0 cubed. And the biggest, biggest, biggest thing, and this is the thing that why this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe is that what this ends up being equal to is infinity, meaning that we get an infinite amount of energy that was radiated from our black body as predicted by the rayleigh genes law. That means for any t that's greater than zero, meaning that any temperature that we know to measure to exist, our energy radiated per unit of time is infinite, and this is obviously false. This is something, this is a huge contradiction of what we observe in reality, not to mention an impossibility, only because we can't have something that irradiates an infinite amount of energy. And so this was the huge failing of, of the rayleigh genes law in trying to predict, and in terms of classical mechanics, trying to predict this physical phenomenon, and that it just gave an answer that was nonsensical. And so what we're going to look at is how this was solved. So the solution came from someone named Max Planck who suggested a revolutionary idea to solve the problem. He suggested that atoms cannot vibrate at any frequency. They can only vibrate at discrete energy levels given by E sub n is equal to n h nu where n could be any integer value, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and on and on and on. This concept we will revisit again and again, where the energy of the system is an integer multiple of the quantity. In this case, it's the frequency of the system. h is a constant of proportionality, but it's now called Planck's constant, and it has a value of 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And in essence, Planck quantized the energy levels of the vibrations of the system. Planck then used this insight to augment the rayleigh genes law by modifying the average energy of each oscillator at a given frequency. His equation stated as 8 pi h nu cubed divided by c cubed e raised to the power of h nu over kbt minus 1 properly assigns the correct spectrum. As one example of the successful solution, the relationship can be used to determine the surface temperature of a star by its emitted light since the stars are almost ideal black bodies. The plot on the left, which shows both the experimental spectrum from a star and the fit to Planck's distribution law for black body radi radiation, shows a remarkable similarity. The dashed line, which represents Planck's distribution law, is plotted for a specific temperature, so a proper fit of the experimentally measured spectrum yields the surface temperature of the star. A second major problem, which was unexplained by classical physics, was tied to something called the photoelectric effect. In the 19th century, the German physicist Heinrich Hertz discovered that ultraviolet light causes electrons to be emitted from a metallic surface. This effect, the photoelectric effect, contradicted classical thinking in two ways. Light of any intensity can eject electrons as long as its frequency is above a threshold value. 
In fact, the intensity of light has no effect on the kinetic energy of the ejected electrons. Classically, light was thought to be an electromagnetic wave, and that its intensity is proportional to the square of its amplitude. As the intensity increases, the light would rattle the electrons harder, causing them to leave the atom in larger quantities. Therefore, it didn't matter the frequency of the light, since it was the intensity that would shake them loose. This wasn't observed, as light with low frequencies with high intensities wouldn't eject electrons from a metal surface. However, light with low intensities but sufficiently high frequencies would eject electrons. Einstein proposed in 1905 that light also is quantized in the packets of energy. These packets are now called photons. Therefore, using a conservation of energy argument, he showed that the kinetic energy, as expressed as 1 half mv squared, is equal to h nu, which is the energy of the photon, minus phi, where phi is the work function. And this relationship essentially says that the kinetic energy of the, electric, of the ejected electron is equal to the energy that was put in by the photon, minus the energy required to eject the photon, and that energy is the work function. This expression can also be written as 1 half mv squared is equal to h times nu minus nu naught, where nu naught is the threshold frequency, meaning the frequency that's required to begin ejecting electrons. Notice that this equation is that of a line, and so the figure on the left shows data from the emissions of electrons from sodium. The first data point is at 5.51 times 10 to the 14 hertz, which represents the threshold frequency. And also note that the slope of this line is equal to Planck's constant h.